question is, when it comes to worship, who do we, how do we render our act of worship? Worship ought never to be to please self, but worship ought to be to please God. We have to put self aside and trust God when it comes to worship. We live in a world that is self-centered. People are more concerned with how they feel and what they want. But we have to put these things aside. And, and as demonstrated through the narrative story of Jacob and Esau, one received the blessing, the other did not, shows us today people who are careless and indifferent will not receive the inherited blessing of God. Then we move to Revelation. We go now to Revelation. And we're going to look at the scenes of worship in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, Revelation chapter 4, you could write those passages down. In the interest of time, we would have to go through them word by word, line by line, but you write them down for verification. In chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, we is, is presented the worship in relation to the throne of God in heaven. We are told that um, the angels of God bow before the throne of God and they rendered unto him true worship. Then we follow this scene in Revelation and we see re worship in relation to the to the to, to the divine to the divine um, act of God in chapter five verses eleven through fourteen. Then we move on. We see worship in relation to the sins of God who passed through great tribulation. Because of their experience, they went through great tribulation in chapter 7, verses 11 through 12. They worshiped God. They rendered worship to him because God gave them salvation. Then we see worship in relation to the seven trumpets of God mentioned, symbolic language there, chapter 11, verses 16 through 17. Then we see worship in relation to Mount Zion and the Lamb in chapter 14. And then we see worship in relation to the seven vials of divine wrath in chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And then we see worship in relation to the marriage supper of the Lamb in chapter 19. Seven scenes of worship in Revelation from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 19. Now, let me just recap and go back to Revelation. In Revelation, there are seven scenes of worship presented from chapter 2 to chapter 32 in Genesis. And then chapter in Revelation, we see also seven acts or seven scenes of worship in the book of Revelation. So why is this so important to us? Is to show us how inspired the word of God is. Do you notice something very unique about each of those activities or acts? It is numbered seven, seven times sequentially, just like the seven days of creation. We see the number seven as a number denoting perfection. So it is by design that God, through the inspiration of his word is bringing to our attention the uniqueness of the seventh day Sabbath, the uniqueness of worship, the uniqueness of rendering to God true obedience, not the way we as human beings perceive and want to worship God, but the way God prescribed that we should worship him. Now also, um, I want to present to you uh, 14 allusions to worship, again, in Revelation, in pairs. Because when you split 14 in two, you have seven on one side and seven on the other side. The worship in Revelation and worship in Genesis is that what happened in Genesis is a replay of what is happening or what has happened in Revelation. Why? Because Jesus, the true witness, says he is Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. And therefore, he has the keys of life and death in his hands. 
because Jesus has the keys, he has unlocked the mystery of the gospel. So Jesus Christ is the center and the central figure of all divine revelation. Jesus Christ came to present to us the correct understanding of who God is. Remember the disciples asked him the questions. They asked him, Lord, would you show us the Father? And he answered them and said, how often or how long rather I have been with you and yet you are asking me to reveal to you the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. In other words, the work that he did, the acts of worship, the manner in which he ministered to people, the way he showed compassion, um, extended grace, the way he forgave people for their sins is exactly the way the Father would have done it if the Father was walking on earth as Jesus walked. In other words, there is no separation when it comes to divinity. Jesus does not act or function outside of the will of his Father. This tells us that when it comes to truthfulness, when it comes to truthfulness of the Word of God, we as believers we as human beings should never deviate nor operate outside of the will of God. When it comes to salvation, my friends, we have to put aside our own prescri prescribed manner or ideology or the way we think or conjure up what and how salvation should be rendered to man. It does not work. We must lay aside our own human reasoning and trust God depending upon his, what he has revealed to us. The reason why this is so important because anything that is done out of sight is not faith. Faith requires us to act upon the things that we cannot handle or touch or see. You see, the Bible says, blessed are those who have not seen but yet believe. We today, living in the 21st century, we have not seen Jesus. But we believe that Jesus Christ came. Why? Because the word of God revealed to us who Jesus is, the real Jesus, the theme for our presentation for the past months, the real Jesus. The real Jesus, my friend, in Revelation is the one who came, died on the cross of Calvary. He was buried. He arose from the grave. He ascended up to heaven. Now, today, he is interceding and soon to return back to this earth as king of kings and lord of lords. Remember last presentation, we talked about the lion and the lamb. When he came the first time, he came as the lamb. But this time, he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, remember, in Genesis we have all the stories relating or pointing to, in figurative language, who Jesus will, how Jesus will come, in what form he will come, and what work will he do. You see, in Genesis, the act of worship was demonstrated when Abel presented a lamb sacrifice, but Cain did not. At the flood, those who respond in obedience to God, we see even through the time before the flood, there were seven days, seven days before the rain precipitated and the door of the ark was shut. Why seven days at the flood? Because the seven days at the flood before the rain precipitated, 
correlates with the seven days of creation and with the seven acts of God in pairs. Notice in pairs. But when human beings refused to enter the ark, God told Noah, order the animals to enter into the ark. Guess how? By pairs. The animals went in by pairs. But when it came to the clean animals, God said to Noah, I want you to order them to enter in by sevens. Very significant. Because at creation, God created everything in six days and he made them in pairs. And now the story of the flood, which is depicting a new act of creation, which God was about to perform. He had the animals who enter in the unclean ones in pairs, in twos, but the clean ones in sevens. So the God of creation is the same God at the flood. And then we come to Revelation. Seven churches, seven stars, seven spirits, seven angels. And this is where I am going to show you in Revelation all of the different descriptions that are given to us to prove to us the inspiration of the valley and the revelation of God through his word. First, we have seven churches, chapter 1, verse 4. Seven spirits of God, chapter 1, verse 4. Seven golden candlesticks, chapter 1, verse 20. Seven stars, chapter 1, verse 20. Seven angels, chapter 1, verse 20. Seven lamps of fire, chapter 4, verse 5. A book sealed with seven seals, chapter 5, verse 11. The beast with seven horns, chapter 5, verse 6. The seven angels with seven trumpets, chapter 8, verse 2. The seven thunders uttered their voices, chapter 10, verse 3. 7,000 men slain in chapter 11, verse 13, by the, uh, the, the, the witnesses. Great red dragon is presented in chapter, with seven heads in chapter 12, verse 3. Seven crowns upon the head of the, the, um, the dragon or the beast. Chapter 12, verse 3. Seven angels holding the seven last plagues. Chapter, 50, chapter 15. Seven angels with the seven trumpets. Chapter 15, verse 1. Seven vials of God's last plagues. Chapter uh, 15. Seven mountains is described in chapter 17, verse 9. Seven kings in chapter 17, verse, verse 10. My dear friends, it is not by accident, but by design to show us that the word of God is truly inspired. It is trustworthy, trustworthy, that we could depend upon it. Praise be to God for the revelation of his word. So, Revelation and Genesis complement each other. Hence the reason why the angel told John, Blessed is he that hear and those that read the word of God. Today, majority of Religious people have put aside the book of Revelation. They claim that the book of Revelation is a sealed book. They claim that it is incomprehensible. But I want to let you know that the star of Revelation is Jesus Christ. He is the centerpiece of Revelation. He is the one that holds the key. He is the one that unlocks. He is the one that presents to us the golden truth that runs like a thread from Genesis all the way down to Revelation. He's the one that was prefigured by the Lamb. And in chapter 5 Revelation of Revelation, it says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John the Baptist, John the Revelator, both testified 
that Jesus Christ is indeed the one who takes away the sins of the world. Today we have people who are looking to different religious leaders and figures, icons from different persuasions as a means to grant them some form of inspiration and perhaps salvation, so they think or claim. But there's only one person, there's only one unique individual throughout the history of humanity presented from Genesis to Revelation that can cleanse us, forgive us, and accept us, and grant us eternal life to save us from all the corruption that is in this world, to grant us, to grant us joy, peace, happiness in this world, beyond the pandemic, beyond any other economic depression or condition, political upheaval, wars, tribulations, all kinds of conditions that we may confront, Jesus Christ, my friend, is the answer. He is the solution. So may God bless you this evening. And I hope that the exercise that I've shared with you from the word of God, particularly those two books, as we looked at the way God presents his acts of creation, his acts of revelation, and how precise and how unique they are in complementing each other. It is my prayer that it will reignite your faith in God so that you could walk by faith, my friends, and not by sight. So may God bless you. And um, I believe that we're going to open the floor for your questions, any question that you may have relative to the presentation for this evening. It is my joy to accommodate and to respond to you from the word of God. Praise God. Thank you very much, Pastor uh, Lawrence. And indeed, we appreciate what you've done for us, Doc, and what you have shared with us. Uh, as I was trying to digest the wealth of information that you set before us uh, from the Word of God, both from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and the last book of the Bible, and to see how they parallel uh, one to another. Uh, I see two schools of thought that I would like to digest what you shared us from, um, rather how you, what you have shared with us. First, uh, on one hand, I see creation by the tri triune God, the three in one God. And then and secondly, I see the importance of worship. So on one hand, creation telling us that Jesus, along with God the Father, God the Son, the three in one God, is creator, redeemer, sustainer of this entire cosmos and the, all of us. And then the, on the other hand, the Bible is pointing us, may it be Genesis or Revelation, is pointing us to our solemn duty which is to worship God, this God who creates and redeem and sustain. Is this a fair um, assessment of what you share with us so far? Absolutely. Indeed, because the centerpiece of the scriptures, particularly the last book, which summarizes everything that is written from Genesis all the way down is God calling upon his creation to worship him, the one who made heaven and earth. And the antithesis, the opposite of worshiping God is to worship the beast or the dragon. So from the very beginning, the devil, or the enemy, the arch enemy of God, have tried to move you, his creation away from worshiping the true God. That's why he led Adam and Eve against God. He led Cain against God. He led the antediluvians, the people at the flood, against God. They choose not to worship the true God. 
we see how Abraham chose to worship God. We see how Jacob chose to worship God. The opposite, the antithesis of that, where God has had people uh, from the very beginning who choose and those who did not worship him in the right way will culminate in the end in the same format. Those who worship God, those who don't worship him. Those who worship him in the right way, those who don't worship him in the right way. Those who worship him on the right day and those who don't worship him on the right day. Everything is precise. So, as you shared that the first book and the last book kind of encapsulate the, the totality uh, of the Bible. And again, you further uh, agree that it's, it's both books along with the entire Bible is speaking to creation and telling us that it's a God, Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who creates, and then we are to worship Him. Now that we have established these facts. Now, how about as we deal with this, as we deal with all of us, the 8 billion of us living on planet Earth, 8 billion of us here, um, uh, as you know, we often share in the show that the Abrahamic faith that consists of the Jewish, of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity made up approximately 5 to 5.5 of the 8 billion of us here living on planet Earth. And so, so as such, the uh, uh, Bible, all, one of the issues that even these religions have outside of Christianity is the issue, is Jesus worthy to be worshipped? Is Jesus worthy to be worshipped? And us in the Christian faith that claim that approximately 3 billion of us, we are saying, yes, Jesus is worthy to, to be worshipped. But as we deal with the Muslim and our Islam, our, our Judaism, our Buddhism, our all the different ism of religion, even Rastafarian, and all the various religions out there, the other 5 billion people that doesn't see Jesus Christ as worthy uh, to be worshipped. Now, as you deal with these books, both Genesis and Revelation, what it is the, the, the message it's saying to not just the Christians, the, eight billion, the three billion of us, but also the other five billion of us who don't see Jesus Christ as divine and worthy of our worship. What is the Bible is saying to us, particular Genesis and Revelation, as you share, share with us, this parallelism? Yeah. Well, one thing is, is for certain. All the different people groups and all of the different religions and isms that you have mentioned, they have, all of them have something in common including Christianity. <clears throat> All of them believed in creation. All of them believed that God created the heavens and the earth. They do. They do. Majority Muslims believe that God created. Um, the, um, the other major religions believe in the God of creation. They call him by different names. Christianity. Likewise, so the act of divine creation is a revelation to all of them. Which means that, according to what the Apostle Paul says, they are without excuse. The creation reveals the glory of God. So they are without excuse. The question of worshiping Jesus or to accept Jesus as God and worship him is not something that is difficult for God to solve. It is not difficult for God to solve that. You see, we may think of us as Christians as the only one that God is revealing his will to. But God is speaking to those people from other denominations and other creeds and other sets in a 
direct as well as an indirect manner, way which God chooses. Now, you see of all the, um, the, thing, the things that are happening in this world, the pandemic, the wars, the earthquakes, the floods, and all of these things, human suffering, there is one person, there's one person that unites everybody together by his mercy and grace, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus, in a very unique way, in fact, let me, let me just give you one example. There was a particular Christian who went to a Muslim country. And he was wondering how could he tell them about Jesus so that they will accept and embrace the message of Jesus. What he did, he says, he began to do the very things that Jesus did when Jesus was on earth. What was the works that Christ did? Christ ministered to the sick. Christ fed the hungry. Christ clothed the naked. Christ set the captives free. Christ exorcised those who were demon-possessed. And the Christians began to do the very same work that Christ did. And guess what? Without him preaching to anyone, all of them came to him and they said, the work that you do must be God's work. Must be God's work. Nobody who does not have God. How could you cast out demons? How could you feed so many people? How could you show so much compassion? And how could you establish medical ministries where you could heal and minister to the sick and the sufferings? When they approach him, he told them, it is because of Jesus Christ. I am doing his work. And that opened the door. Christianity need to stop pushing Christ down people's throat and start doing the work of Christ so that the work of Christ will convict and convince people. Here's what Jesus says. By this shall men know that ye have my disciples if ye have love one for another. I remember reading a statement from uh, someone who was interviewing the, head, the, great, the great Mahatma Gandhi. And they said to Mahatma, you know, Mahatma was the found, um, father of um, modern India. He was the one who led India to independence under the British colonial rule. And uh, Mahatma was preaching nonviolence and the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness for the shall. That's what he was preaching. So they said to him, Mahatma, how can you say you are a Hindu and you are preaching the gospel of Jesus. Are you a Christian? And the great Mahatma Gandhi answered and said, Christianity, no, but Jesus, yes. There is not one person in the world, regardless of their religious affiliation or background or nationality, that would reject the grace of mercy, grace, compassion, forgiveness, healing. You tell me who will reject somebody who will come to them and offer them food? Who will reject somebody who will come to them and offer them lodging and clothing and shelter? Who will reject somebody who will come to you and present, when you are sick, present you with medicine and healing? Who? All of humanity embrace the acts of love and kindness. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And the way you worship Jesus is to embrace his, his acts, his deeds. When you accept Christ's deeds, you have embraced him. And in a unique way, you are rendering worship to him. Praise God. Is there a statement or a question? Good evening. I have a question. Is everyone... Yes, that does uh, good deeds, uh, can they be classified as, as Christians or followers of Jesus? If we see people out there doing things that seem good, looks good, uh, do we call them Christians? or followers? We, may, we, we may not call them Christians, or we don't have to call them Christians, but we could call them children of God. 
we call them children of God. Thank because you. They, because they're doing God's work. You know, sometimes a labeling or using a name can create division or separation. For example, we are Christians, right? But people call us Seventh-day Adventists. They call us Pentecostal. They call us Baptist. They call us... So those names are not the important thing. The important thing is by their fruits, you shall know them. And that's what God is looking for, you know. When Jesus Christ comes, he's not going to ask us from which church or which denomination or which, where we did affiliate. No, 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 no. He will say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. I was homeless and you brought me in. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. And then we will say, Lord, when did we see you to do such great deeds? As much, in as much, Jesus says, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So people who are doing those good deeds are literally following Jesus unbeknown to them. They are following Jesus because Jesus will say, in as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So there are Muslims, Baptists, all kinds of people, they are following Jesus and they don't even realize it. You see, denomination and a name of churches and religion, these things are, this, this is a smokescreen. The devil is using that to confuse people and to separate people. But at the final analysis, Pastor Barnaby, just like we studied from creation, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, the people who were saved in the flood, those who were destroyed, the two groups of people continue to run through the garment of scripture all the way down to Revelation. And Jesus says, the sheep will be on the right hand, the goat on the left hand, the wheat and the tears. There are two places where human beings will end up final destiny, destination, heaven and hell, eternal life, eternal damnation. Now, hear my follow-up, uh, 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 Pastor. Among us, we have atheists and agnostic, even in real time on this platform right now. So we have Christians, we have Muslim, we got Jews, we got atheists, we got agnostic, we have all the, a mixture of all of us here. In the, the common thread that you express in different ways from Genesis to Revelation, or from Revelation going back to Genesis, and you mentioned that, that there are two groups of people, one that will come to the knowledge of God and one that will walk away from God. How do you speak to all 8 billion of us and the subgroup within the 8 billion of us? Some of us are atheists, some of us are agnostic, some of us are Catholic, some of us are Adventists. What is God saying to us? When God say, come out of her, my people, is God saying we must come out of, the, of that which the devil enthroped to, uh, that, that the devil set up, or the trap that the devil has set up to deceive you, the human race? Everybody, everyone will never come out of Babylon. They will never come out of their religious um, groupings. Um, they will not do it. As a matter of fact, what God has asked us to do is to witness to all the world. He says to witness to all the world. Jesus never never commissioned us to convert the world. The world, he knew that the world will never be converted. The world will never be converted. There are millions and billions of people that will never respond to Jesus. They will not. You know, how long did Noah preach to the antediluvians? I mean, we are told, right? 120, 120 and, years. And how many people responded? In the final analysis, eight. <laughs> How about Sodom and Gomorrah? Same How thing, many under, out? under 10. Okay. So throughout history, we have example after example of the majority of people who would adamantly reject the 
the invitation to turn to God as plainly as it could possibly be presented, as clearly as daylight, there are human beings who will still stand against it and reject it. There's nothing we could do about it and not, not even God himself can do anything about it because God will never force anybody to serve him or to turn to him. The Bible is replete with the whosoever will. The whosoever will. We are created free moral agents and we have to demonstrate our love to God by making a conscientious decision out of our own free will to serve God out of love and gratitude and sincere appreciation never by compulsion, never by cohesion, never by uh, any force measure. It has to be out of our desire, own heart that we choose, we choose. Jesus says there are two roads, one that leads to eternal life and the other to destruction. Broad is the way, broad is the way, but it is crooked that leads to uh, destruction, but the way that leads to eternal life, Jesus says, it is narrow, but guess what? It is straight. And he says, few, Jesus says, few there be that go in their heart. So when we look at the billions of people, the population of this world, unfortunately, when we study the Bible, we study the scriptures, God never promised us that all a billion people will turn to God now. So given, the, given that we have known that, what is our responsibility in terms of the proclamation of the gospel? Yes, it, to, to witness, to witness. Jesus says, as a witness unto all nations, so that at the end of the day, nobody will have an excuse and say they did not hear or they did not know. They will have to make a conscious decision after they hear the gospel. So what we are doing right now, we are doing exactly what Christ asked us to do. We have to make it as abundantly clear and plain as possible. And when people listen to it, they looked at it, and then they would say, for example, no matter how we explain to some people that there's one race, the human race, it doesn't matter what color, it doesn't matter what race, what background, we are all human beings. There are educated people, smart people with PhDs who will still look at you and say to you that they are superior than you because of the color of your skin. There are some people in the world who still believe, in spite of all the evidence that is shown, they still believe that the earth is flat, not round. <laughs> and these are educated people. There are still people who believe that the coronavirus is fake. It's, 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 it's not real. And they are seeing death all around them. And these are educated people. So human beings are very complex. When we look at how people could look in the face of evidence, the Supreme Court and other courts, judges, they would look at a case where a man is completely innocent and yet still they will pronounce him or her guilty. Human beings, the problem with human beings is that we are all sinful and sin has impeded our judgment. So our judgment at best is defective. The only way out is for us to dismiss and stop depending on our own reasoning ability, our own rationale, our own intelligence, and trust God by exercising faith in him. And say, listen, if you are an atheist and you're listening right now, you're an atheist, or you're an agnostic, and you are listening right now, my advice to you is, say, I do not understand Christianity or even the gospel may not make sense to you. But do one thing. Say, I'm going to trust God. Even though I do not understand him, I do not understand the concept 
of a divine being, but choose to believe in him and you will be saved. Praise God. There's a question from one of the social media platforms, I believe it's YouTube, and I think the question says, those that are doing good to human beings, can they re receive salvation through the good deed that they're doing? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, good deeds, works of any uh, meritorious uh, form cannot procure salvation. In other words, human beings cannot save themselves by what we do. Salvation is something that is done for us. And it is outside of us. Because if we could have saved ourselves, then there was there, would, there was no need for Jesus Christ to come. We could have done it our own. We could have, you know, uh, get ourselves out of the mess without depending on an outside source. But from the very first instant that sin came into the human experience, human beings needed a substitute. They needed somebody to come and rescue them. Uh, sin placed us in a very precarious situation. And the mercies of God came. And that's why the Bible says in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, they went and hid themselves. But God came in the cool of the day, searching for them and asking them, Adam, where are you? So God has, in, has been in pursuit of humanity. God has been searching for us. So the preaching of the gospel is God's way of searching for humanity, looking for humanity, calling humanity. It's an invitation. The prophet Isaiah says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, mm -hmm. they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But if you are willing, mm, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. So God is appealing to us. He is reaching out to us. But whatever work that we would perform does not indicate or does not prove that we are saved by doing such good work. The Pre salvation experience comes from what Jesus Christ has already done. Thank you very much. And so in, for, for that person that asked that question, can you, your good deed save you? Based on what Pastor Dr. Lawrence has shared with us, um, based upon the evidence of scripture, the simple answer is no. You cannot, yeah. you cannot be saved by your good work. No, the own... Apostle Paul says it in, in Ephesians, is by grace ye are saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, and let me add by, even by keeping of the Ten Commandments or the law, that does not save you either. Keeping of the commandments and the law and even the Sabbath, obedience to God and observing the Sabbath, these are all good deeds. These are all good works. These are all works of obedience. But it is a sign that we have already accepted the gift of salvation, which is through Jesus Christ. And therefore, we have decided or made up our minds to walk in obedience to God by keeping his commandments and observing the Sabbath. Not as a means to be saved, but because of the gift of salvation that has been freely given to us through Jesus Christ, we render to him acts of obedience. Thank you very much, Pastor. Keep uh, and, and, and you on the various social media platform continue to, to send your question. And if we don't answer it today, I promise you uh, tomorrow we will answer some of your question. But you, us, uh, the live audience here, is there another statement or a question? Uh, I think we have time for one more statement or one more or one or two more statement or question at the most um, given the time. Is there another statement or a question from someone else? I have a question, um, Pastor. Could you please clarify for us just what is worship? I know worship has many facets. And the Bible says, worship the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. But in general, what can we take away as to what worship is? Very good question, my sister. Very good question. Um, Jesus had a discussion with a woman he met at a well. 
And uh, the woman asks where, where the conversation went on between the two of them where the woman indicated that she is a true worshiper because she was she claimed connection or lineage to Jacob. But Jesus answered her and said, whosoever worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And therefore the father is looking for such worshipers, spirit and truth. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> to worship God in spirit and truth, which means therefore you cannot worship God with a wrong intention or the wrong ideas or in, uh, ideology or concept. You have to be sincere by not trusting yourself, not trusting man, but relying solely and exclusively on God's revelation, his revelation, what he has revealed to, to us in his word. So therefore, it says that we are worshiping in him in spirit as well as in truth. Revelation 14 verse 6 says, God says with announcement to all the world to worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Again, it re-emphasizing truthfulness in our worship experience. We cannot claim to worship the creator and yet still not be obedient to what the creator does and what he has revealed to us. We cannot worship God in, in 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 peace in peace with piecemeal in other words in uh by having a what i call a buffet style approach pick and choose what you want say okay i like this day i don't like this day therefore i don't go to church on that day that therefore i rather the uh, first day of the week you cannot say well i want to serve god but i want to eat whatever i want you cannot say well i want to go to heaven i want to serve god but I want to dress how I want to do what I, what I want to do. No, you have to be focused on doing the will of God in truth and in spirit. Put aside our own ideas, our own likes or dislikes, our own perception. Put these things aside and say, you know what? I'd rather do what God says, whether... I like it or not, whether I, you know, it pleases me or not, I am here to please God. So the woman at the well, when Christ told her the Father is looking for those who are worshiping in spirit and in truth, realized that all the time she was she had the wrong idea of worship. She was doing her own thing. And the moment she decided enough is enough, she's gonna stop doing her own thing, follow the will of God. She got peace of mind, she was liberated. She was forgiven for her sins and she went to the entire village and says, come, I have heard a man who spoke to me and told me things that I've never... Now, listen to what the excuse that she came up with when Christ says, go and call your husband. She retorted and told Jesus, oh, I don't have any husband. Christ says, oh, really? Well, you have five and the one you have is not even yours. So people come up with all different kinds of excuses when it comes to worship God and we cannot continue to come up with excuses and think that we are worshiping God the right way. We have to dismiss and put aside all human excuses. Stop saying, oh, this is my tradition. Stop saying this is my way of life. Stop saying this is my culture. Stop saying this is where my parents brought me. Stop saying uh, my friends go there, so therefore I have to go there too. None of these things mount up to the understanding of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. We have to divest ourselves of everything that is human and focus only on doing the will of God. That's the kind of people that God is looking for. Praise God. That's the kind of worshipers. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, beloved. Indeed. Today, the gospel has been preached in your presence. And you are responsible for that which you heard. For example, we talk about the Sabbath. You are now responsible for, for that. God is going to hold you accountable. And for example, your grandmother and your great-grandmother may die and live up to the best of their knowledge and will make it into the kingdom of God. 
you know heard about it, so you know are responsible for it. You are responsible for it. And because God will not hold us accountable for that which you know have the opportunity to, to, to be exposed to. You are an atheist, you are an agnostic, and we, we share with you that Jesus is God, the Word of God. After these words leave our lips, then God the Holy Spirit is there working with you behind the scene. When we are not there, God the Holy Spirit is still speaking to you. Not just God the Holy Spirit, but holy angels. Holy angels that are co-workers with God are also working to encourage your heart. And so if you re keep rejecting the Holy Spirit, then you come to a point, then that is the ultimate sin when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. And to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to reject what the Holy Spirit keeps saying to you. And then you, you, you now will be held accountable or we will be held accountable. And so, Pastor, we want to thank you for making the, the Word of God uh, so clear, so clear. With that being said, Pastor, if you could go ahead and lead us in the prayer this time, please. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow this evening, communicating with you and our loved ones, ministering, carrying the gospel to all the world, and allowing you to use us and to manifest your presence with us. We thank you for giving us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, clarity of thought, and sincerity of heart to do your will. We pray for forgiveness. We pray that you will have mercy upon us. We pray that you'll forgive us for our sins because you are the sin-pardoning Savior. Every other leader in this world cannot forgive us for our sins. Only God can. For you are the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. For you have proclaimed and stated clearly in your word that you came, that we might have life and that have, we might have it more abundantly. And for those individuals, oh Father, all of us who are sick, who are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, we need healing. We need a divine touch. We pray that you will touch us through the divine comforter, the Holy Spirit. Let us feel the moving of your presence in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we make this request that you minister to Elder Crawford. You know his condition. You know his situation. You know the pain, the discomfort that he's going through. And you know his fears and doubts and concerns and those that surround him, his family and friends. May their faith increase and may he experience the mercies of God in his life in a way that will truly indicate that a loving God cares for him. Father, we pray for Sister Sarah and her son. We pray, O oh God, that you will touch their lives, minister to them, bring them peace of mind, and let the, the touch of God, like the woman who touched the hem of his garment, be their experience today. So pray for Nimhard and the rest of the family, young uh, Alicia, Alicia, I pray for those who are uh, seeking for you, that they will find you, that those who have made up their minds to accept you as the Lord and Savior, that they will never turn back nor retreat, but that they will continue to press forward. They continue to exercise faith in you. There are a lot of things, oh God, we do not fully understand and we will never be able to understand everything in this life because of our human limitations. But with God, all things are possible. That's what the angel Gabriel told Mary. And so we pray that the impossible things that we are facing, we are confronted with, you will make them possible for us, including healing, including restoration, and most important of all, salvation in Jesus Christ. Bless this ministry. 
Bless Pastor Barnaby. Bless his wife. Bless his children. Continue to protect them. Continue to maintain and show them favor. I pray that Jabez's prayer, that you will extend and expand their territory by way of taking this ministry to the next level, the level that will be able to belt and embrace the globe with the everlasting gospel of the kingdom. Provide the finances, provide the talents, the individuals, those with vision, just like you blessed the ancient Israelites with the men who were endowed with the, the talent to build the sanctuary. You told Moses that you have men whom you have endowed with special gifts. You can do the same for us today so that we can build the spiritual tabernacle through human beings because you dwell not in buildings, but in the hearts of men and women. So Father, we thank you in advance for having make, make, made the provision, having provided for us what it needed because you commissioned us to go into all the world. Therefore, you will provide the means to carry your work forward. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. As Pastor Lawrence has shared with us, our responsibility is to preach the gospel. And when we preach the gospel, it will vindicate our God. There will be two groups of people on this earth one who will reject God and one who will accept God. Nevertheless, our job is to preach the gospel with such a clarity that people will make that executive decision to worship God or not to worship God. And as Pastor Lawrence shared us both from the book of Revelation and back to Genesis, you see this two principal theme in, this, in these books that summarize the entire Bible. First, it pointed us to God as being creator. And secondly, point us that because God created us, then a part of our duty as his creatures is to give worship to him. And so by preaching the gospel, we help humanity to come to the knowledge so they can make an executive decision if they will follow God or reject God. Hello, my name is Pastor Owen Barnaby, President of Fana Shout Television and Social Media Network. Fana Shout's objective is to join hands and hearts with our fellow men, holy angels, and God himself in sharing God's redemptive love with the entire world, that Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world the Redeemer of the world, and that Jesus has promised us he will come back to receive us unto himself. Please join our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love in three ways, with your time, your giftedness, and your resource. First, with your time. Watch and share Final Shout 24-7 anywhere in the world on the following platforms. Final Shout on Rooker TV. Final Shout on Fire TV. Final Shout TV on Apple TV. Social media such as Facebook or Meta. YouTube, Twitter. Download our Android and Apple phone apps. Or you can watch us 24-7 on our website. Watch.fanashout.org Second, with your giftedness. Become Fana Shout's show producer, director, contributor, host, hostess, or you can tell us of your giftedness and how you would like to serve. Third, with your resource. Support Final Shout financially. Become Final Shout's 12 Stars Club member. 
which help with our monthly operations budget. Two, become a sponsor of a show or sponsor a series of shows. Both individuals and businesses can be sponsors. And three, choose our merchandise. Thank you in advance for your prayerful consideration in joining our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love. As the joy of the Lord is final shouts strength.